Hello and welcome to the Newberry's Ask an Archivist Facebook Live event. My name is Allison Hinderleiter, and I want to welcome all of you to our very first ever Ask an Archivist Facebook chat. Um, if you don't know very much about the Newberry Library, we are an independent research library that is open to the public. We are in Chicago, Illinois, and we've been around since 1887. And uh, we've been collecting archives and manuscripts since around 1941. So we've been around for a while. Um, and I am the curator of the Modern Manuscripts and Archives uh, section of the Newberry. I am the fourth in line after three other ladies who've preceded me. And I am joined today by my colleagues, um, Manuscripts and Archives Librarian Catherine Grand George, which you should also see on your screen, and Emily Richardson, our project archivist. And um, we are taking questions for this hour. Um, we'll be looking at them in the chat and addressing them in the order that we, we encounter them. Um, you can ask us anything, not necessarily going to get the definitive answer today, but we'll do our best. And, um, and then when, um, when we do get some questions, um, we'll sort of take turns and kind of round robin the answers if it's appropriate. We can also share our screen so we can show you some things and we do have some surprises for you today. Um, but I will start off by talking about my work as an archivist, and then I'll invite uh, Catherine and Emily to talk about it a little bit as well. So uh, I've been an archivist for a long time. I got my uh, degree in library science in 1991, so I am pre-internet. Um, and I've been working in various archives and manuscript repositories, mostly in the Chicago area. Uh, since 1992. So um, been around for a while. And <laughs> um, I've worked with a variety of collections. I've worked with personal papers. Um, I've worked with organizational records. I've worked um, with photographs, scrapbooks, papers, digital material, audiovisual. Um, and I really do love working in Chicago because there are so many wonderful institutions around the city and we are all kind of interconnected through a collections consortium called the Chicago Collections Consortium, not surprisingly. And um, my day is generally working both with donors of material and looking through catalogs of materials that's for sale that, um, that I could potentially purchase. I have a small budget for doing that. I also field reference questions from all over the world. Um, and I work on making collections more accessible to everyone. And that includes uh, arranging them, organizing them, uh, creating descriptive inventories called finding aids for them. Um, and then also working with our digital initiatives and services department to digitize material and put them Put them up online so people can see them remotely if they can't make it into the library. Um, I'm going to pass it on to Catherine and Catherine can talk a little bit about her job. Hi everyone, welcome to Ask an Archivist Facebook Live and YouTube edition. Um, as Allison said, this is our first year doing it in this format, so this is a lot of fun. Um, if you're just joining us, we're just talking about um, what we do at the Newberry. So I've been at the Newberry for about six years now and um, worked in special collections and archives during that time. Um, a big part of my job is to work with the collections and make sure that they're arranged and described in a way that makes them accessible for uh, anyone that wants to come research at the library. Um, as Allison mentioned, that's a, a very large variety of types of collections as well as material types. Um, so it's really fun because we never know what we're going to encounter each day, um, whether it's <clears throat> working with someone that comes to the library and needs to talk to one of us or a remote researcher who has a question. Um, 
So that's a, a lot of my time, but as you see, we're a small team. So it's really fun that we all get to be involved in kind of the entire life cycle of a collection from getting it and working with the donors to making it accessible, hopefully getting it digitized. And again, answering those reference questions. So I'll pass it over to Emily to add. So I am Emily. I am a project archivist at Newberry Library. Um, I started in 2017, um, so I am the young end of the team, and um, have been here ever since. Um, the area behind us is our uh, processing area, our main processing area, so there's a lot in the background that you can see. Um, but that is, I, I work on a lot of larger collections, just kind of weeding them down. We have limited space uh, as a lot of archives are finding um, that they are running out of space <laughs> for as many archives as they want. Um, so uh, I take larger collections and I very viciously rip them apart and try to keep only the things that will have value going forward. Um, that is probably one of the hardest things that archivists have to do is determine what will have value, basically be fortune tellers, um, to determine what will have value 50, 100, 200 years down the road. Um, and sometimes the existential dread can set in. Um, I also uh, create binding aids uh, and answer reference requests. We have quite a large variety of material here, anything from dance to um, political papers. Uh, we have a large genealogy collection. Um, so really it's a great place to work. You just never know what you're going to delve into next. Um, I will pass it back to Allison for our first question. Great, yeah. We uh, thank you both. Um, just as a reminder, this is a Facebook Live event sponsored by the Newberry Library. We are all staff at the Newberry Library um, and this is Ask an Archivist Day. Um, and uh, it's, it's part of a group of events that are happening nationwide for National Archives Month, which is October every year. Uh, our first question is, could you tell us about the messiest collection you ever received and what it took to organize it? Do either of you wanna take that on? I just, I would preface it by saying, um, we get collections and donations, mostly donations in, in various ways. Sometimes we go to the donor's house, office, garage, storage space, um, what have you, and we survey it there. Um, other times the material comes to us. It could come to us through the mail. It could come through a drop-off. It could come through hundreds of shipping boxes. Um, it's a really a wide variety of ways it comes in. And sometimes it's well organized and sometimes it isn't. You want to uh, talk about, yeah? Go yeah, ahead. I can take that. Uh, the first collection that I actually was hired to come in to work on was the Roadmaps and Travel Ephemera collection, which was a hot mess. Um, it is very, it, it's hundreds of linear feet long uh, and covers the entire world. Um, they were uh, just roadmaps from, you know, the 1920s up until modern day in there, as well as ephemera. Um, related to travels uh, that people had collected. It didn't come from any specific donor. It was just uh, a collection that had been gathered from a variety of sources. Um, and I came in sort of a quarter to a third of the way through it already being worked on. Um, so imagine a room full of boxes and you don't know what's in the boxes uh, and you open them up and there's just a bunch of papers inside that aren't folded, that, you know, there might be something from Great Britain here, and there might be something from Canada here, and um, having to look up place names or type on your phone in Arabic. I got really good at pretend Arabic <laughs> on my phone, <laughs> trying to figure out what, what things were. Um, so that was probably one of the messiest ones, uh, but it's just really fulfilling at the end to look at your collection and with all the folders that are neatly organized and and yes do stroke it and just go my precious you're so pretty now <laughs> um so yeah that that definitely is up there with 
one of the largest and most overwhelming collections <laughs> to start with. That's great. And you did a great job in organizing it. And now the finding aid is online. So if you're looking for anything having to do with tourist maps, brochures, road maps, gas station maps, um, anywhere, mostly US, but also uh, different countries, North American countries and some European, um, then you can look at our website and check out that finding aid. Um, the next question is, tell us about the music collections. I, I didn't mention that. That's only one facet of the, the abundance of Newberry collections uh, that are housed in this one building. But music is very important um, facet of it. it. Some of our first accessions that we got in the 1880s and 1890s were music collections. We did a big purchase, and then we had donations. Um, it is overwhelmingly music on paper, um, not so much audiovisual, although we have a little bit of that scattered here and there, but our music goes back to um, early modern music, treatises from the 14th century, all the way to modern electronic music um, by um, composers like Ray Wilding White. And um, we have manuscripts, we have printed material, printed editions of music. We have uh, personal papers of composers, musicians, music clubs. We recently got the Musicians Club of Women material. Um, we also got um, very recently a wonderful uh, collection of papers by a composer named Patrice Michaels who um, just wrote a song cycle about her mother-in-law, uh, who is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and so it's very timely as well, um, covers 14th through 21st centuries. Um, it is almost all works on paper, um, just so you know, because we don't have a listening booth or anything like that. But um, we, we cover uh, classical and popular music pretty completely. Um, Alice J asks, how do you know you, how did you know you wanted to be an archivist? I'm not going to try to commandeer everything, but I do have a fun story. Um, when I was an undergrad, I had the pleasure of um, taking a class with a visiting professor named Gloria Watkins, um, whose gnome de plume is bell hooks. And uh, she was looking at some of the work that I was doing. I was creating a finding guide to uh, how to find materials about slave narratives in the library of my undergraduate library. And she said, do you want to be a librarian? I said, yeah, I've been thinking about it, yes. And she said, we think you should be an archivist. Um, it's more fun, it pays better, and it's a less female dominated profession. Um, I don't know about the last two, but I do think it's more fun, so. I don't know if you two want to share your origin stories. Yeah, I'll chime in. Um, I, my answer to that question would be, I didn't know I wanted to be an archivist. Um, I knew uh, that I wanted to go to library school. And when I did that, I was kind of all over the place. And I just kind of took every class that seemed interesting and thought I wanted to be a reference librarian because there's a lot of different areas of librarianship. Um, and archivists, I mean, and librarians, there's some weird terminology there. But in, in a sense, we were all responsible for providing access to collections. Um, and uh, so through my school and working as a library assistant at the Newberry, I figured, hey, archives are really cool. And I really like being able to take a really big collection or even a small one and kind of describe it in a way that makes sense. Because um, especially at the Newberry, we have a separate cataloging department and they focus much, uh, very much on individual items, um, which I also love. Uh, that type of work too. But um, just so be able to describe things and make them accessible is kind of um, what clicked with me. And I think we, we kind of joke that there's like an archivist gene. Um, I think as individuals, we're pretty organized people <laughs> um, and on top of things. So it, it certainly is, is a really fun area of work. Uh, yeah, I was always the organized one growing up. I was always the one um, trying to force my family to actually get all of their stuff together. 
I remember multiple times doing that to my smaller sister and her running out of the room crying because she liked to keep everything her way. And I'm like, no, you have to do it this way. <laughs> um, so that really should have been a sign. Uh, but then uh, when I went into library school, I did think that I was going to go into public libraries. Um, and then I realized uh, when I was doing, you know, my archiving and records management classes were where I was actually like going above and beyond the assignments and doing things that I shouldn't, you know, that, that I wasn't doing in my public library classes, where I was just like, oh, I got the assignment done. And so I went, uh-huh, maybe I should look into this thing that I'm actually enjoying <laughs> and see what it's actually all about. Uh, and so kind of didn't look back after that. Um, it's, it's definitely got its ups and downs. Um, but yeah, that's, um, I, that's probably another question on there. So that's really how I got into it. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, for those of you just joining us, this is Ask an Archivist uh, at the Newberry Library. All three of us here on your screen are uh, archivists at the Newberry in Chicago, which is an independent research library that is free and open to the public. Um, we, I will go down the list of questions we've already received. Um, we have a question from AJ who has, asks, how has curating changed in the last decade? Um, I, full disclosure, I've only been in this position of curator uh, for two years, two and a half years. Um, and before that, I was in Catherine's position of, as manuscripts and archives librarian. Um, but I was able to observe our, our my predecessor, Martha Briggs, um, working as a curator. And so I can kind of answer that question. Um, we, uh, here at the Newberry, we are still um, taking in donations more than, um, than purchasing materials. There are other libraries around who have a much bigger purchasing budget. We're very lucky that um, the word has gone out that we are very interested in donations of materials from families, from clubs and organizations, from businesses, from individuals. Um, and if they have good research value, we take them. Um, there are some things we have to ask now about that uh, about electronic records that we didn't have to in the last decade. Um, I mean, they definitely existed in the last decade, and we certainly have gotten collections with um, floppy disks and zip drives and, and things in older media. Um, but in the last decade or so, the donors themselves are more aware of what they are giving us that are digital or electronic records. There's um, questions that we answer about emails um, or about data sets or about in terms of our, our uh, history of the book and printing in terms of for type designers. Um, we get questions about how to best <clears throat> preserve electronic files um, that may be on you know, proprietary formats or unusual formats. And so we're working um, much more with a combination of physical and digital or electronic materials than we ever have before. So that's a good question, thank you. Um, got a question from Tom. He says, uh, every museum and archive across North America seems to be soliciting objects and records to document the pandemic. What have you added to the Newberry's collection to document this moment in time? Um, well, I mentioned at the top of the hour about our um, working collaboratively with other institutions around the Chicago area to make sure that we don't um, duplicate efforts too much or wind up competing over collections. And so at the beginning of the pandemic, I reached out to my colleagues at other places and um, the Chicago History Museum has stepped up to collect pandemic related material. So we kind of stepped back because we did consider doing that. Um, and we do have a modern protest collection. And so um, this year has been so crazy with um, both a pandemic and an econo economic depression and, and um, protest and unrest in the streets. Um, we wanted to make sure that Chicago was adequately represented in all ways and documented. And so we put our efforts towards soliciting materials on the protest movements, um, electronic ones, um, 
includes things like photographs, electronic photographs, and also memories and narratives. And um, Chicago History Museum has stepped up to take pandemic uh, related material. I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. We're getting a long list of questions. This is awesome. I was just going to quickly add that um, one thing that we've talked about is trying to document just how the Newberry itself as a staff has reacted to the pandemic, the things we've been doing at home. So I know our photographer has been documenting some changes to the building and how we're working in our spaces right now. Um, as you can see, all three of us are in different areas of the library right now to <laughs> be socially distant. So um, uh, because we do collect our own institutional history as part of our modern manuscripts. So good point. Um, we have a lot more questions, but I kind of wanted to take a break and do like a quick show and tell. Um, Emily, do you want to show the photo album that you that we received yeah, recently? Sure. Uh, so this is part of our uh, a genealogy collection. It's the, the Carton Wells family. Um, this is an addition to the rest of their papers that we just received. Uh, it's a photo album from a travel collection to their trip, from their trip to Europe. Um, so there's a lot of different fo uh, um, photos in here. They've been glued on, which is not our, our favorite, um, especially since the paper is very brittle. Um, however, it is just gonna stay in this format for a little bit because there's not really an easy way to get them off. <laughs> so um, this is, you might have some of these lying around your home um, from, from past uh, trips or from, from previous generations and stuff. You really wanna check the paper. Uh, so like for instance, we follow the two fold format. So if you fold it once and then fold it twice and see that just completely broke off. So that means that the paper is really, really brittle and probably needs to be replaced at some point. Um, but yeah, you can see like they did a really good job documenting their travels, the camera's a little, you know, off. Um, and just how Europe was like during that time. So I can see somebody wanting a uh, genealogy value uh, of, of the family. They went come and look at this collection. Uh, somebody who wanted to look at Europe during the early 1900s or 1891, sorry, 1891, uh, really uh, getting to come in and look at some of these photos. There's some good architecture photos in here as well. So that's my little bit of show and tell. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you're just tuning in, this is a Facebook Live event of the Ask an Archivist on Ask an Archivist Day. Um, we are the staff at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And thank you for all your questions. We're gonna address a few more, and then maybe we'll take another break and do another show and tell. Um, AJ asks, what is your approach to determine an item can be part of a collection? Um, that is usually determined um, if it's a purchase and if it's over a certain dollar amount, it is determined by committee. I am part of a collection development steering committee which has uh, about six or seven selectors, staff members at the library, along with our vice president of collections and library services. And we do talk uh, quite a bit about um, adding collections and adding items to our collections. We talk about the research value. We talk about its uniqueness. We talk about its connections to other parts of the library's collections. Um, its potential for exhibits um, and its potential for uh, doing either public programs or any other sort of outreach, uh, whether or not it can be digitized. So all of these things are considered. Um, we also have on our website a uh, section called Core Collections, and it, it describes the things that we collect. You know, it's, it's a wide variety of things, but it is sort of loosely tied together by the idea of the study of the humanities. Um, and then we have some specifics that we are particularly strong in, like the history of uh, Native Americans and indigenous peoples, um, the history of the book and printing, um, the history of the Western United States and the Midwest, genealogy, just to name a few. So we always take these into consideration 
when we uh, determine what item, uh, if an item is a suitable addition to our collection. Um, next question, Lauren asks, what kinds of research projects are you working on now? Uh, does anyone want to talk about the Mellon grant we just got, just briefly? Or do you want me to? <laughs> Silence. Um, okay. Uh, the the one of the major research projects that we just are starting to to uh, embark on is in conjunction with the Newberry's own research center um, on the history of the American Indian and Indigenous people. It's called the McNichol Center, named after um, its founder Darcy McNichol, who founded the the department in 1971, and uh, we are working with various uh, other departments in the library to really take a good look at our materials about Native American and in Indigenous communities and making sure that our um, descriptions are both accurate and respectful. And, um, and in doing that, the McNichol Center is really embarking on a, um, a unique and new um, endeavor, which is uh, communicating with various uh, tribal communities around the United States and having them come in and having us, our staff go out to where they are and um, talking about traditional knowledge, talking about uh, respectful terms, um, talking about ways to describe collections that um, are uh, not as uh, colonial centric as they have been in the past. So we're really, the Newberry is really making efforts to come to a reckoning with the ways that um, indigenous materials have been described by non-indigenous people and um, working with tribal communities and elders to rectify those, those past practices. So that's one of our many research projects. Um, the next question, Stephanie asks, do you work with rare and antiquarian acquisitions? And if so, what's the process with those as far as cataloging, storage, labeling, et cetera? That's not so much our department. Um, I do, I'm a selector for music. And so I work with other staff, uh, sometimes with antiquarian acquisitions in music um, or sometimes drama or other performing arts materials. Um, we have a rare books cataloger um, who works with European material and um, also our custodian of the wing uh, collection on the history of printing and book arts works a lot more with those. When we say modern manuscripts, um, we mean post 1700. So I guess it's kind of your question of what, what constitutes as an antiquarian because some people would think something from 1700 would be antiquarian. But you know, remember the Newberry has things that go back to the year one um, and uh, a lot of early modern manuscripts too. So that's not really what we archivists, our team specifically here deals with. Um, but we, we do work with others in doing that. We also are very lucky that we have a, a top-notch conservation department. So if there are materials that are in need of conservation, older materials, um, materials on vellum, uh, things that need to be rebound or repaired or disbound and cleaned and washed and repaired or prepped for exhibits, our conservation department does that. And then we also work with our collection services department who do the cataloging, the rare book cataloging. So it really is a team effort to take care of these antiquarian materials. So thank you for that question. Uh, another question, are there parts of your job that people don't know about or that you didn't expect when you started? What is the favorite part of your job? I can pass that on because I've been talking plenty. I'll go. Um, 
I'll start with my favorite part of the job is uh, Emily kind of alluded to this earlier is there's just a real satisfaction when you uh, finish a collection and it takes a lot of work to get to that point, obviously, um, also depending on the size and the condition what the materials are like. Um, but I, you know, I do this job because I want to provide access to the materials we have and without make you know arrangement and description which is again what our department really focuses on those aren't aren't as accessible um, another favorite part of my job at the newberry specifically is that we're really proud to provide access to our collections that we haven't yet arranged and described and we try to do our best to help people narrow down what they might want to look for um, other places may not allow that level of access so we, we really try to be open and accessible which is is, is exciting um, I didn't expect in this position to have to make so many decisions every day. Um, <laughs> as we've kind of talked about, uh, a big part of our job is weeding and deciding what has enduring research value. Um, and so we have to balance that with uh, researchers needs, space, time, money, supplies, everything. Uh, so I always joke Okay, as someone who is pretty indecisive as a person, um, it's funny that my job is essentially doing making decisions all day. Um, but I'm lucky that we're I'm a part of this great team, and we we often talk things over um, if we're ever stuck or, or need need a second opinion. Uh, I will quickly jump in. I know we've got a lot of questions. Um, my favorite part, I think, is trying to figure out. Um, like solving mysteries. So for instance, uh, in this one collection that I worked on, a genealogy collection, um, uh, there were letters back and forth between this one woman and then who I assumed to be two men. And I was like, is she two times now? But um, apparently they had nicknames for each other that um, were very, very obscure and um, wild. So that, that was kind of fun to explore. Um, and obviously it's not always that gossipy or anything, but uh, just figuring out how people connect. Uh, and then the part that I did not anticipate was just how much time you will spend writing on folders. <laughs> Your hand will cramp up at least once a day. Um, and it's a good week if you make it through without getting a paper cut. Yes, paper cuts are the bane of our existence. Um, yeah, the different archives do things different ways. Some sometimes people we need to we need to label our folders, obviously. Um, and some places will print out labels onto stickers and then stick those onto the folders. Um, other places use stamps. We use a combination of stamps and just our good old pencils. So we have our favorite pencils. That's another thing I never knew I would get. In, later in life, a, a preference for mechanical pencils, but this one is my absolute favorite. And if anybody takes it off my desk, I will be very cross with them. Um, you do get, it is, you know, physical. You can, you know, get a little bit of uh, cramping or tendonitis from writing too long. So we try to um, do that for a little while and then do something else, you know, give our hands a rest. We're also lifting a lot of boxes and maneuvering them and moving them onto shelves and so you know you get a workout um i'm going to do one more question and then we'll we'll break for another show and tell maybe Catherine can find something in her bag of tricks here um there's another question from alice j also curious how you see it see our jobs i think adapting in the future especially given the pandemic. Well, that's something we've been reflecting on uh, all year. The, the preconceived notion is that archivists probably don't have anything to do if they can't get to the physical materials that are in front of them. But we have found since we were working from home from March through July, that there is lots of stuff to get done and you don't necessarily have to be in the building, you can be remote. Um, we have a lot of metadata in our digital asset management system that needed to be cleaned up. And by metadata, I mean descriptive uh, descriptions of the stuff. Um, just you know, to put it in the most you know basic terms, um, we do have audiovisual material, for example, like oral histories and interviews. Um, when we get those 
in a, from a collection. They can be on any format and we digitize them and then we put the digital files in our, um, our management system. We had access to the management system and we had all of these audio files that we had never listened to because we never had the time to. Um, and so we had time to watch videos and films. Um, I want to mention we have a huge dance collection. The Midwest, the Chicago Dance Collection has, you know, about a hundred uh, different uh, papers, manuscripts, and archival collections from dancers and dance companies like Hubbard Street and, um, and Mo Ming, and they all have obviously audio and digital video files. And so we had a, we had a lot of time to work on that. And if for some reason we have to leave the building again for a period of time, we're, we're prepared. We have things in place that we can still be working on. Um, okay, hope that answers your question. And just as a reminder, if you're tuning in, this is Ask an Archivist Day, October 7th, 2020. Facebook Live and YouTube, and you are listening to the archivists at the Newberry Library in Chicago, and welcome, and thank you for joining us. So, um, Catherine, do you have something you want to show everybody? Sure. Um, so earlier we talked about how at the Newberry, we're very fortunate to have an entire conservation department that does the true heavy lifting when it comes to long-term preservation and conservation of our collections. Um, but having said that, we encounter lots of weird uh, things that happen over time with paper and other, other items. So we have a box of materials, um, and I can't show you all of them, but um, that we call preservation no-nos, things that um, are not good. So I have an example of this is a duplicate photograph from the Arts Club records, which we have. As you can see, it's a, a, an art piece, but then there's like kind of some weird coloration up here. And that came because over time, the photo that was on top of it had a sticker on the back that over time discolored the photograph itself. So the, I showed this just because a lot of times we get questions about preservation and conservation. And, um, and sometimes we, we do our best to make sure that things like this aren't on top of each other, either interleaving it with acid-free paper or depending on the collection, maybe each photograph gets its own folder. That's a lot of work though. Um, so that, that often comes up when people are talking about their own family papers and we, we recommend you know, keeping things um, cool and dry and dark um, as best as we can. Um, so we have a lot of examples and we'd be happy to share more of those in the future and avoiding adhesives. So yeah. for all of you at home archivists, if you are compiling your scrapbooks or uh, materials, please uh, avoid adhesives, tape, stickers, even post-it notes uh, if you can, because even post-it notes do tend to leave a residue over time. And um, I, have a, I have a scrapbook too, I'll show you more of it, but you know, these, these photo corners you see here, those are kind of the best ways, even though this is a 1930s scrapbook, this lovely picture of a wedding party from 1930. Um, there, on the back, there are things that are glued like Emily was showing, but on, the, but on this side, there are photo corners and the photo corners protect and keep the photos in place without using the adhesives that go, can go directly onto the photograph. So you can get photo corners at a hobby store, or you can go to an archival supply uh, website to get them. Oh, next question, Kristen E. I think I know who that is. Hello, Kristen E. Are there any myths you wish you could debunk about being an archivist besides the white gloves myth? And we're not even gonna talk about the white gloves myth. Um, I think the biggest myth that I would like to debunk is that archivists keep everything. We don't, that's a hoarder. <laughs> Archivists um, cannot, we cannot possibly keep everything. If you think about the material that comes in, like 100, 200 boxes that span someone's career or an organization's life or uh, a business's entire you know, lifetime, there's no way we could keep all of that in one building. It just isn't feasible. And there's also a lot of material 
that is extraneous. There are duplicates of things, there are Xeroxes of things, there's runs of uh, printed material that are not related at all. Um, you know, when you go through personal papers, sometimes there's, uh, there's stuff stuck in there that the, the donor doesn't even realize they've put in, you know. Um, and so we, we don't keep everything. Um, and from collections that are from the 1960s on with so many Xeroxes, uh, so many photocopies, we do weed them very heavily. And we, uh, again, we, we just try to get to the essential material that has research value for people. It also saves the time of the researcher. They're not going through all of this extraneous stuff. So what, what we're really trying to do is, is help out with access there. Do you two have any other myths you want to debunk? I'll add, um, I think it's a myth that people are like, oh, haven't you just digitized this entire collection? And I know that comes up a lot is, uh, uh, well, I'll just keep it short and say, there's a lot of work that goes into that. And it's kind of a, a process um, from, again, we have to get the materials ready physically, and then they have to actually be digitized. And then we have to create the metadata or the information about the collection um, to find it accessible. So um, I won't go into the weeds with it, but but yeah, it's it's a lot more complicated than you think. Yeah, we're not Google. We don't have one of those giant book scanners that we can just feed our manuscripts into and have it read the pages in five seconds. That's that's not possible for things from you know the 1700s or whatnot or beyond. Um, I would say my biggest one is the classic. Oh, so like you just get to smell books all day. I'm like, no, I don't just smell old things all day. <laughs> Some of them have real weird smells. And if you'd smelled some of those old books, you would not think that it was attractive. <laughs> yeah, dust allergies are another sort of occupational hazard of ours too. Um, what is your favorite item at the Newberry Archivists? Do you have one? I have one. Um, it, it relates to music. Um, I haven't mentioned this, but I am, I'm also a musician. I play piano and keyboards. And there's a original nocturne written by Chopin in our collection. And that is my absolute favorite. I just love looking at it. I love to see his own handwriting on it. I love to see his markings. Excuse me for a sec. I'm fine just talk too long. Um, and so it's from 1846. He died in 1849. So it's one of his later pieces. And um, it's absolutely one of my favorites to, to bring out and show people. It's gorgeous. I, I don't have a favorite. It's like picking a favorite child. It's just too many, too many things. But um, I love when I do bring people to the library, I try to tailor it to their interests because we basically have something for everyone. Um, we got one from KJ. She says, who are your favorite fictional librarians and archivists in pop culture? I like Tammy uh, from Parks and Rec. That's just me because she instills Second fear. It. Tammy Swanson, yep. No, I can't stand her. I mean, I know that's the point, but <laughs> um, I really like Evelyn from The Mummy. Um, I think she is very proud of the fact that she's a librarian and I can understand that, that pride. <laughs> awesome. Um, if you're just tuning in, we're in the last 15 minutes of our Ask an Archivist Hour, and we still have a few questions to go. I did want to show just briefly a new acquisition that we got. This is a purchase, um, so it's a little different because normally we get donations, but a book dealer over the summer was offering a photo album of a woman named Edith Shaw, who was uh, a nurse uh, around Chicago. She's African-American. And she studied nursing at Provident Hospital in Chicago, which is the first uh, black owned and operated hospital in the United States. It also was the site of the very first 
open heart surgery in the United States. And so um, Ms. Shaw is pictured here in front of Provident Hospital. Um, and then she is here, I think on the rooftop with her brother Maurice, who also trained uh, as a, uh, at Providence, uh, he became a doctor. And so this was, um, you can see by the holes, this was an intact photo album. This was one that we actually disbound because it is um, in, because the cover was coming apart. It was sort of a rotting leather cover and it didn't really, um, have any, we kept it, but you know, it's wrapped. And so it, it's not uh, sort of shedding the, the leather powder, which is what happens when it deteriorates onto these pages. And then these pages are, were separated and folded to help protect them. Um, and they were kept in the same order that she had them in. And they are available for research. So all you have to do is come to the library. We are open nowadays, uh, Tuesdays through Fridays from 10 to four. We are open by appointment only. Um, and this goes into our next question, actually. Um, COVID has changed so much in the world of museums and libraries. How many archives have been affected at all, if at all? Um, all of us have. Um, all of us that are open to the public or even those closed archives um, have had to change. Um, just the way that that life in the United States and elsewhere has had to change. Um, the Newberry was closed to the public for quite a while and closed to staff. And we are now open. Um, we used to be walk ins, um, you know, open Tuesday through Saturday, we've had to reduce our hours. Um, and we are open by appointment only you need to make an appointment in, on uh, through our website. Um, for a morning or an afternoon slot to use our reading rooms. Um, items that have been consulted are then put in quarantine for four days to make sure that it's safe for uh, both the staff and other researchers to handle. And um, yeah, so a lot of things have changed. Um, that's just kind of scratching the surface of it. I do want to emphasize though that we are uh, we are reopen um, for researchers and then we also are increasing our online footprint so that more material is available um, digitally than ever before and we're, we're working very hard uh, with our digital initiatives department to push out more material digitally. Um, our transcription projects have been very successful. A lot of people working from home had fun either tagging our postcards or transcribing our handwritten letters that we had posted online and we're going to uh, sort of refill that cup very soon. And <laughs> yeah, and we're all wearing masks. So except for right now, but we do have, excuse me, a Newberry mask. Sign of the times. Um, Nathan asks, how is the Newberry working to increase diversity and inclusion in archival work as a profession? Um, thank you for asking that. We um, have a working group that Emily is a part of the DEI initiatives uh, working group within the library. And we've been talking about more about mentorship um, and recruiting more librarians and archivists of color. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good time to talk about it. It's not a great time for hiring. Um, as you may imagine, we, are, we currently have a hiring freeze like a lot of other institutions do. And in fact, we had to furlough um, a few of our staff. Um, and so this is, something that we are not working on immediately, obviously, but when the funding comes in, we will. I don't know if, Emily, you want to talk about the, the objectives of the DEI working group briefly. Yeah, so it is a fairly new group, um, but we are working in about 14 different areas, um, just internally and externally, uh, to really focus on um, what 
issues are present and how can we remedy that? So uh, with accessibility in our collections is a very external one. And then communication internal and external, making sure that we're just a really welcoming environment um, and a welcoming culture and not something that's just white centric. Um, which as you can see, we are, we are all white. <laughs> so we do have just that, you know, white narrative that we can tell and, and we, we push against that. We want to um, be more um, open and welcoming to, to other um, people's points of view. Um, one project uh, that we are working on is we've discovered that a lot of uh, people of color just don't go to library school. Either they don't know that it's an option uh, or it's a not very well paying job. And so if you're trying to break out of a poverty cycle, it's you, you don't go to library school. Um, so kind of uh, starting off, um, we're trying to start off more on, on that side of things because you can't really hire somebody until there's more people you know, in the field who are diverse. Um, so we're, we're starting there. Uh, and hopefully, uh, once we start that pipeline along, um, more people will apply of color. Um, that has been a problem in the past, just we don't have anybody applying. Um, and so, yeah, that is, that is definitely an issue that we're working on. Uh, and then we are also working on just um, the Newberry's role um, in, in people's lives as well. Uh, so how can we support uh, family uh, and different, different um, diversities around us um, just in, in how uh, we allow people to access our collections, how we uh, treat people when they walk in the door, we think is really important because um, that's your first point of, of service. Um, so just we're analyzing a lot of these things and kind of working on audits. Uh, and then after that, we'll be moving forward on a lot of, a lot of new objectives. Thank you. Um, and then Nathan has another question. What is the approximate cost of digitizing material? Is it worth digitizing an entire collection? Um, the answer to that, I think, is going to be sort of the, the it depends <laughs> answer. Um, if you're digitizing an entire collection, um, which we have done with, uh, you know, for example, French Revolution pr pamphlets, about 30,000 French Revolution pamphlets, we outsourced those. Um, so we did actually ship them to a, uh, a company that was able to do a faster feed of digitization. If we do it in-house, it may be between, um, it may be a dollar in exposure, just on average, if you figure in the costs of labor and the machines and then the storage, um, or it could be more like five to $10 in exposure. If it's something oversized, like a map, if it has to be unfolded, um, if it has to be super high res um, in order for it to be seen. Um, and so it, it, it is a big question, and again, you know, the Newberry has a committee of called the Digital Initiatives Advisory Group, um, and we do talk about sort of the pluses and minuses of digitizing entire collections. Um, that being said, we do think it is valuable to digitize collections. Um, it provides so much better access. Um, to those materials. Sometimes it's helpful in terms of preserving them so they're not physically handled as much. Um, items like, like the Popol Vuh, which uh, we have in our collection is um, an extraordinarily important text of the, the Quiche people, the Mayan people. And we are custodians of that text. And we understand that a lot of people want to study it and, and a lot of people want to view it. Um, for people who want to study it, we have you know, a facsimile available for them, just as an example. But then we still have the original for, for people to, um, to visit and to um, experience. Um, do you have advice for prospective archivists? What are you excited about for the future of the field? 
I'll uh, jump in and say, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to an archivist and just chat with us. Um, I know a lot of us do kind of informational interviews a lot of times with students or people who are in library school, but in general, we, we like chatting about the field and, and what to expect. And, um, you know, and a lot of advice is just kind of get, get your hands dirty in terms of internships and volunteer experiences and, and um, to find out how different organizations approach their collections. Not every place does things exactly the same. So um, I just think it's really fun to uh, just kind of dive in and do that. Um, excited about the future of the field. I think um, I'm just really excited to see how we're gonna handle all this digital stuff. Um, it, it comes up all the time. We've mentioned uh, audiovisual materials. We've mentioned born digital emails. Uh, there's just so much. The way that people communicate has absolutely changed. Um, when's the last time you wrote a letter to somebody physically? Um, so uh, just how we're going to not only capture that, preserve it, but also make it accessible. Excellent. We've got about five minutes left. If there's a there's a good question here, I will sh just answer a question, a uh, real quick yes or no one first. Lauren asks, are those masks available in the library store? Yes. The limited supply. So the library store is the bookshop is open um, 12 to 4 Tuesdays through Fridays. Um, you can walk in to that. You don't need an appointment to go to the store. You do need to sign up though, because we are contact tracing in case anybody gets sick. So um, when you come into the, the bookstore, just quickly sign your name and some contact information and then, um, and then shop away, shop to your heart's content. Um, Nathan asks, how can archives like the Newberry move beyond gatekeeping and better engage the public into what's located within collections? Um, I think this is something the Newberry has been grappling with for a very long time. Um, we are seen as sort of this fortress that you're not allowed in if you don't have the right degree or you don't have the right letter of recommendation. Um, it comes from a much stricter time um, in the, I think in the 50s, 60s and 70s when they were more exclusive. Um, so we, we can say it and say it and say it, but then we actually have to go out and do it too. So we can say we are open to the public. You do not need any sort of credential to get in. All you need is uh, an ID and then you register for a reader's card, which is free. You have to be over 14, but that is our only restriction. Um, but we are trying to move beyond that through various ways that we have outreach. Um, one is doing programs like this and many other pro public programs. We have a public engagement department that is absolutely fabulous um, in um, reaching out and, and trying to bring people in for either author talks, panel discussions. Um, we also have adult education seminars. Um, and then we uh, have a whole department devoted to working with teachers. And so the teacher programs department um, does a lot of digital program packs for teachers. Um, before pandemic, we invited people in, uh, in groups all the time to learn more about the Newberry's collections. And um, we have stopped that now, but we still do a lot of remote uh, outreach to our patrons. And um, last year we did a very successful project about uh, the 1919 riots where we went out into communities. Um, we had panel discussions, we had bike tours, um, we had all sorts of informative and, and fun activities for that. And we've got, we've kind of increased our, our footprint in, in Chicago in that way. And we're looking to do more of that, uh, especially when it is safe to do so. Um, we're always open for more suggestions too from you all. And I think we got to the end of the questions and the end of the hour at the same time. So for those of you who tuned in, I wanna thank you very much for spending this hour with us. Um, you can always reach us either through the Newberry Facebook page or go to our Newberry website um, and contact us either directly or through our reference portal. Um, 
and we'll be happy to answer any questions specific or general that you have. Thanks, Thanks for so all much. the questions, everybody. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll have to do with this format again next year, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was great. Join us next October. Yeah. <laughs> or before then. <laughs> or before <Stay> then. <laughs> all right.